Deborah Dana, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So when do neuroscience and law most often cross paths? Well, neuroscience and law cross paths in many different ways. You'll see this interlinkage in a number of different fields. You'll see it in tort law. You'll see it in contracts, for example, on whether somebody who's signing a contract has can fully understand or what they're signing. You certainly see it increasingly in elder law, but also FDA laws such as neurotechnology and artificial intelligence. It really has a huge span. But the the most significant use is in the criminal law, and it reverberates out. The findings in criminal law reverberate out to different kinds of fields. And the reason for that is so many uh, individuals who are convicted of crimes have brain injuries or some kind of brain problem that invites this kind of neuroscience in to analyze what's happening with their behavior. You have written that, quote, the entire modern criminal justice system is based on an outmoded psychology of mental states. Absolutely. What I mean by that is an outmoded set of mental states is much of criminal law is based on Freudian psychoanalysis. A lot of people don't know that, but when a modern criminal law Uh, code was being developed in the 1950s and 1960s, many of the commentators and advisors on that code had a psychoanalytic background. In addition, Freud had a huge impact on the United States. It's no accident that that impact also infiltrated into the legal system. So when I say it's outmoded, That's what I'm talking about. Many of our cases, many of our uh, expert testimony evidence in criminal cases is based on this Freudian psychoanalytic foundation, which we really don't identify with anymore in a modern world. You did mention that a lot of our criminal law is based on, on these philosophical concepts. And looking at the various statutes, they all do, almost all of them, except for the statutory uh, laws, require some sort of a mental state, right? So it's defendant acted knowingly or willingly or recklessly or, or so on and so forth. Why is it that criminal law developed in that way that prosecutors have to prove some sort of mens rea or, or a mental state? Well, mental state is critical to the criminal law. Every crime has two key aspects of it. Number one is the act. Criminals have to engage in some kind of act of some some type. And number two is mental state or what's called mens rea. And mens rea has always been critical since the 13th century, uh, a critical component of of whether or not we find somebody blameworthy or whether or not we want to punish them. The reason being is every crime has to have some level of culpability and blameworthiness. And the feeling in the criminal law is if you punish somebody and they're not blameworthy or culpable for what they did, that this is a violation of our civilization or of our civil rights and who we are as human beings. Uh, and that we simply would don't recognize this as being a proper way of, of treating humans or treating individuals or members of our community. So if it happens that in 20 or 30 years, we uncover that in fact, we don't have a choice. The determinism is the correct way of understanding the brain and we're not actually um, you know, the I in us isn't directing our actions. Does this upend our criminal justice system? What does it do for rationales like retribution and deterrence, which we use to justify punishment? And what would that mean as a whole for how our criminal law is practiced? There may come a day where we find out that all of our behavior is determined. The determinism is the is what's driving us and not free will at all. That wouldn't surprise me. And I think the more we find out about how people think and act, the more we realize that there's 
a lot going on there that may question how much free will we really have. Uh, if, if that's the case, or if science starts encouraging us to look in that direction, then I think it's, it would be imperative for us to completely rethink our criminal justice system. Right now, our criminal justice system is based on the feeling that there is free will, that we all have control over our behavior. Indeed, even in the 1960s, when we were revising our criminal justice system, uh, the individuals writing the code recognize that we have to act as though people have free will, even if they don't. That's just the only choice we have at this point. But that new science may change that. We may know that we, we really don't have free will. Uh, and uh, and I, I think we're, we're going to have to change entirely how we approach any kind of incarceration for individuals who may be uncontrollably violent, et cetera. I think we're going to have to change our society entirely. And, and my hope is that we could start thinking about those changes now, uh, even if we end up finding that we do have free will. Is there a difference between the brain and the mind? You know, there's been a longstanding debate on whether there's a difference between the brain and the mind. And I think that, you know, somebody's answer to that would depend on how much they embrace determinism and the feeling that that uh, we have any kind of control uh, over, over our behavior. So, you know, if you're a determinist, you're going to think they're probably pretty closely one and the same. If you're someone who has even a feeling that we might have a sliver of free will, you may think that there, there's a difference between the two. I sort of romanticize these, these kinds of arguments. I like to think that even though so much are, of our behavior is determined uh, unconsciously that I'm still holding out hope that there's a sliver of free will there, uh, in which case the answer would be, we have a brain, we have a mind. Maybe the mind isn't as large as we thought it was, but we still have a little bit of it. At some point, technology will evolve to a point where machines can read our thoughts or see what's in our subconscious. Um, how do you see the legal system responding to that kind of technology? I think when we have a world where we are all relying on new technology that can read people's minds or figure out people's thoughts, we're going to be in a very different kind of society than we are now. This kind of technology changes every aspect of our lives. And so our legal system will change accordingly. Uh, and um, it's, it's not as though our legal system is going to be in one world and we're going to be in a, a different kind of world that doesn't recognize this technology. It's going to affect our view of criminals and how we're going, we think of punishing them. And my hope is that we'll think very differently about them, either rehabilitation uh, in a way that will comport to our norms and values in a positive way, as opposed to the negative types of rehabilitation that we've seen historically, uh, but that will be a kinder and gentler uh, society and use this neurotechnology in a way that's beneficial and, and kinder. That's my hope. Of course, uh, we know now that it could always, it could always be uh, misused, but you know, this is all going back to the way much of our criminal justice system was historically. Sigmund Freud and Freudian psychoanalysis started having a large impact in, in our country in the early 1900s. That impact didn't change just our criminal justice system. It changed our entire society and how we all viewed the world and how we all viewed mental states. So I imagine that any kind of new technology and neurotechnology will do the same thing. We will be a different society and hopefully will be a much kinder and gentler one than we are right now. Looking at this field of neuroscience and law, it's very fertile ground for philosophical debates. You see people, you know, arguing, do we have free will or is it determinism and uh, conversations of that sort. 
What do you think is uh, the practical value of these debates? Because I noticed that um, in doing this research, a lot of the conversation is actually dominated by this philosophy rather than the more hands-on, practical, evidence-based approach you have taken in your research. I think philosophical debates and philosophical pro- approaches to neuroscience and its uh, and where it should fit in the criminal justice system are very important. Philosophy has always served as the foundation of the criminal law, and it gives the criminal law guidance, uh, particularly since criminal law is based so much on our morals and our normative system. At the same time, uh, I don't think philosophy should outweigh or dominate our approaches to looking at neuroscience in the context of the criminal justice system. I think it's much more important as well to look at research and to see how neuroscience is being used in a practical way. One reason I started doing the research I'm conducting right now and continuing to do is because I felt there wasn't enough practical information on the use of neuroscientific evidence in the criminal justice system. I thought some of the claims and conclusions that were being made were faulty. And I've since discovered they really are. Once you start looking at neuroscience in the criminal justice system, we realized that there were a lot of myths and misconceptions about its use and applicability in the criminal justice system. So I would like to think that we still need this philosophical and moral foundation, but at the same time, we need much more research to investigate how neuroscientific evidence is being used in the criminal justice system and how it can improve uh, where we're going, particularly in the area of um, incapacitation, uh, how prisons are operating, and how we punish individuals. When courts do admit neuroscience evidence, When does it most often happen? What's the context? Yeah, in the criminal law, neuroscience evidence is admitted in criminal cases in about three major ways. Number one, it can be admitted at the guilt phase, in in other words, to determine whether or not a defendant is guilty or innocent. In other words, whether they are privy to the insanity defense or diminished capacity. In other words, whether we're going to convict them of a crime. The second major way is at the sentencing phase. So, uh, and, and this occurs a lot in death penalty cases. So when you're trying to evaluate whether or not, uh, say a jury is going to sentence a defendant to death or not, neuroscience evidence comes in in a major way to explain why the defendant did what they did and why we may want to sympathize with them or, better understand the reasons for their extreme violence or something to that effect. So a third way it enters the criminal justice system, which I've found in my research, is it's used by prosecutors to to measure the degree of injury that a victim might have experienced. And, And these kinds of cases predominantly are shaken baby cases. So if you want to determine, for example, whether or not uh, an infant suffered from shaken baby syndrome, you would look at that infant's brain. And the major way you would do that is by looking at neuroimaging or MRIs or some other kind of technology to measure that. You have written that when prosecutors submit evidence on the shaken baby syndrome, they are, quote, permitted to concoct intent out of brain scans that were admitted for the sole purpose of presenting the victim's injury. So how is it that judges allow for prosecutors to sort of expand the scope uh, uh, for for the evidence when it's uh, entered for one purpose? Okay, shaken baby syndrome is extremely controversial because prosecutors do rely on brain scan evidence to assess the nature and degree of a of whether shaken baby syndrome occurred at all and the extent of the injury. The reason it's so controversial is prosecutors will use that injury to argue that a defendant intended to shake or injure uh, 
a child. And in some, many of these cases, a child's actually killed so uh, or murdered. So the prosecutor will look at the injury and explain the defendant's mental state based on that injury. And that's several steps away from how we usually look at intent in the criminal law. Usually you look at the defendant's mental state and whether they were suffering from some kind of trauma or brain injury, but to look at the victim's injury and assume from that a defendant's level of intent is several steps away. And it's really not, not the kind of argument that prosecutors are supposed to be able or are supposed to be making in this kind of context. And judges accept this evidence because sometimes they simply don't understand it. That's number one. And sometimes experts testifying in court will steer judges in that direction when they really shouldn't. You found that despite uh, popular belief that Prosecutors don't use this evidence to argue that a defendant is uh, predisposed to violent behavior and presents a danger to society. Um, while there are some of these arguments, it's less than people think. So how, how does that work? Why, why don't they make that argument? So, it, you know, a major reason initially uh, not to introduce neuroscientific evidence in the courtroom was the claim that prosecutors are going to use it at a gross disadvantage to defense to defendants. In other words, they're going to argue that this science shows that the, the defendant's going to be a future danger. You know, if they have some kind of brain injury, they're hardwired to violence, and there's nothing that we can do about that. And while prosecutors do make that argument. Sometimes they don't make it nearly as enough, enough or as much as people had anticipated. And there's several reasons for that. Number one is prosecutors are concerned that this neuroscientific evidence is going to be much more mitigating than aggravating if it's introduced into the courtroom. In other words, they're concerned that this is going to cause juries to be much more sympathetic to the defendant than than aggravating or angry at the defendant. And it's a toss of a coin. You know, it's hard to predict how juries are going to view this evidence, but almost always prosecutors want to get it out of the courtroom. Defense attorneys want to get it in, prosecutors want to get it out. And that's a statement in and of itself. Uh, that, uh, so uh, the, the biggest way that prosecutors use it this evidence that I'm starting to find now, um, now that I've increased my database, is they will make the claim that defendants are malingering. In other words, that defendants are lying ab about this brain injury or this brain trauma that they have. And there are tests of malingering that can be conducted on defendants that might show that the defendant is lying. So, so that I've seen a huge increase in prosecutors using uh, these malingering tests if, in fact, defense attorneys introduce it in court. What are these malingering tests? How, how do they work? Can you explain the neuroscience behind that? Yes. I mean, they, um, they're, first of all, they're uh, malingering tests uh, range in quality and variety. Uh, but basically, the, a common test is for a psychologist to question a defendant about, you know, a claim that they're making uh, of some sort about some kind of trauma that they have or some hallucinations that they, they may be having. And it's a series of questions that uh, that may test whether or not a defendant is lying. And the way they answer those questions may come up with a test of how whether a defendant is lying. Now, there's a lot of controversy on how good these tests are and how, how uh, valid and reliable they are. Nonetheless, it's pretty powerful evidence to introduce that into court. Uh, and uh, it, it, particularly if 
a, a neuroscientist or some kind of psychologist is able to make the claim that a defendant is lying. That said, uh, you know, a strength of neuroscientific evidence is to show that somebody can't fake an MRI or frontal lobe damage or something that, that uh, or a brain tumor or something like that, that great. Usually these malingering tests come in when uh, the, the injuries are more subtle uh, and the measurements of them are more subtle. We have these findings on neuroplasticity that the environment and our experiences really shapes our brain. And I wonder what you think the takeaways are there for how we think about incarceration and how we can re-envision how we imprison and jail people. One of the most important contributions that neuroscience has made to the criminal justice system and to the legal system generally is to show us how incredibly ineffective and dangerous and self-defeating prisons are. Uh, we already know that prisons are environment that just make it much worse for individuals who have some kind of brain damage or brain trauma or challenges. Uh, if somebody has brain trauma to begin with, it's going to be made much worse when they're, if they're incarcerated. At the same time, we know that some people are very dangerous and we have to in, incapacitate them some in some way before we can ever release them. So I think you know, neuroscience has shown us that over and over again, that we have to change our prisons. We have to change the environment. We have to make it different, acknowledging that most people in prisons have some kind of mental illness or brain trauma. And once we recognize that, we can start to create an environment that's less punitive uh, and, and less retributive and going with the goal of rehabilitation or helping people with mental illness and brain trauma, helping them to get jobs, for example. Let me give you a hypothetical. Say um, we have brain scan evidence showing that uh, the defendant has a really big tumor in their brain and the expert testifies that this tumor um, beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, made him lose control over his impulses. So when he shot and killed his boss, who was ta taunting him, he had uh, no control over that immediate impulse to act out violently. Um, there is also testimony that this uh, tumor can't be removed. And um, the defendant is very likely could have this, these kinds of episodes in the future. So we know that he, in this situation, didn't have control. It wasn't much of a deliberative choice that he made. We also know that he could present danger to society. Um, what should the punishment or the response be in a situation like that? You know, every case involving neuroscientific evidence or any kind of evidence always brings up moral and normative questions that we have to decide as philosophers or members of a community. So neuroscience can only help us so much in making that kind of determination. So if, if there is a situation where a defendant has a brain tumor and it can't be removed and uh, an expert testifies that, that there's uh, some likelihood that this tumor might be affecting the defendant's behavior then becomes sort of a moral and normative decision that we make. There becomes a point where the science ends and we as a community or as a civilization has to decide what we want to do with someone. So we could say this person might be a danger in the future. It's maybe unclear whether there'll ever be a danger, but there at least there's some likelihood they may be dangerous. And we may want to incarcerate that person because of that likelihood of danger. Uh, number two, we may uh, develop or come up with a situation where we put that person on probation 
where they have to check in and report to someone regularly and and say how they're feeling medically or whether they're having violent impulses or something something like this. I mean, this is the case with uh, some sex offenders, for example, uh, who may have urges their entire life. And uh, and number three, uh, you know, there may be a decision, and there has been in some cases, it could be very controversial, uh, where there could be some kind of med- medical intervention. Say you can't remove the tumor without purportedly uh, killing this person, but there may be other ways of attempting to control their violent impulses by you know, inserting a brain implant or something something like that. And we as a society have to decide you know, what kinds of decisions we're going to make in these kinds of cases. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, uh, but we certainly will uh, because there's growing evidence that it's just around the corner that we're going to be able to read people's thoughts. There's certainly enough going on there that number two, we're already uh, having scientists insert brain implants for some individuals who are, have epileptic seizures, et cetera. So, you know, number three, if we can have some kind of medical intervention for a defendant that could control their potentially illegal behavior, uh, I suppose at some point we're going to have to decide whether this is normatively or morally acceptable. I want to shift to a somewhat related topic, and that's behavioral genetics. When we're talking about evidence, what's what's the difference between neuroscientific evidence and behavioral genetics evidence? Well, neuroscientific evidence and behavioral genetics evidence often overlap. In other words, uh, a lot of the neuroscientific evidence cases that I look at will also have behavioral uh, genetics evidence arguments in them. In my research, I separate the two, though, uh, the the arguments, because legally, uh, courts treat those arguments very differently. With behavioral genetics evidence, it's, it's a much narrower kind of argument. Typically, in these cases, a defendant's going to claim that based on some kind of genetic condition, in other words, something that they have inherited or received behaviorally across generations or directly from their parents, that they act the way they do. Uh, So this has come up in a number of cases. You know, a classic case is the Susan Smith case. It happened some time ago, Uh, but this was a woman who made a claim and it's really uh, that uh, she, she drowned her her sons. Uh, she put them in a car and put the car in a lake and they they drowned. And, and she uh, jumped out of the car, right? And she Before. jumped out of the car. That's right. And uh, and blamed somebody else for, for doing this. But uh, but you know they found out that she was she was actually the person who who engaged in 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 the act. Uh, but her attorney David Brock uh, you know, made a number of arguments on her behalf. What One of the major arguments that didn't get as much press was that she had a family history of very uh, serious depression. Her father had depression, her grandparents had depression, et cetera. Uh, in many of these de- really highly publicized death penalty cases, attorneys will come in and go back to sometimes the 1800s in terms of a family tree. And uh, to see the lineage of any kind of passage of some kind of uh, attribute that may be genetic, that could include depression, mental illness, alcoholism, uh, you name it, that might have heightened the likelihood or the probability that someone would engage in a very kind of, a very violent kind of behavior relative to other kinds of people. So, um, so, so this is going to be different from neuroscientific evidence, which is much more present oriented and based on, on that particular uh, defendant and their brain makeup or something like this. Here you're going past back generations uh, to, to make that kind of claim. These kinds of arguments can be very effective in court uh, because 
the uh, judges often will say, uh, why did you, Susan Smith, engage in this act, but many other people in your exact same situation didn't, or your siblings aren't violent, or something like that, in which case these kinds of genetic arguments can overcome that kind of questioning, either from a judge or uh, from a prosecutor. If you could answer any question at all uh, within your lifetime, what would it be? One of the last remaining mysteries, uh, something that we haven't figured out is uh, how to measure consciousness. And, you know, human consciousness uh, and scientists have long tried to measure it and scientists from every conceivable field. And they still don't get it. Uh, what makes us consciously aware of what we're doing. And so I'd love it if we could measure that. And someday we will, uh, but we haven't yet. Everdana, thank you so much for joining me on Office Hours. Okay, thank you, Tamara.